When you think of the first black superstar, you might think maybe of Denzel Washington or Will Smith or going back a bit further, maybe Sidney Poitier. But one name kind of reigns above all of those, and that is Paul Robeson, uh, an actor, singer, activist, uh, trained lawyer and athlete, a guy who had it all and about whom we know too little. I think Paul Robeson is a fascinating figure about whom people know very little. He's born in 1898 in Princeton, New Jersey, and he is um, the, the son of a freed slave. So he's kind of got that uh, rebellious political spirit from a very early age, and it doesn't take him long to excel in a number of fields. He discovers that he's got this talent uh, for singing and, and for, for projecting on stage, so he makes a big hit uh, on stage at college. First, I would say that here is a part which has dignity for the Negro actor. Often we don't get those opportunities. And I would say that my people will be very proud of, 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 of my or any other Negro actor appearing in such, in such a part. And he actually stars in 1925 uh, in his first uh, major feature film, which is a silent film uh, called Body and Soul. <laughs> In this, he plays this extraordinary double role, playing a, a corrupt, crooked, firebrand, Pentecostal preacher and his mild-mannered twin brother. It might sound like a slightly ironic choice to, to, to talk about body and soul, because this silent era movie robs Robeson of his rich voice, but uh, the expressiveness with which he performs and inhabits these two very different characters, and his power just careens through the screen, even though it was a silent movie. When you look at something like The Emperor Jones, the adaptation of Eugene O'Neill's play, which is, I believe, the first time that a black actor in, in a major American studio picture is billed above white actors, he's taking a risk on playing an ambiguous and complicated character who does, in some ways, revert to those anti-black stereotypes that we talk about, the idea of this savage brute. Um, but he's brave enough to, to take that role on and bring layers to it. Takes a silver bullet to kill Brutus Jones. It didn't save him from being criticised in the black community, in the black press, for in some ways perpetuating uh, these negative stereotypes. These are happening in, in segregated theatres, so this is uh, a Jim, Jim Crow era America. So you have these uh, independent black filmmakers like Michaud and Spencer Williams who are operating entirely independently of the Hollywood system, and they're making films about black subjects for black audiences. I mean, these films were quite widely seen, so his talent was recognised and he wasn't afraid to put himself forward. Arguably, Robeson's um, most famous role in Hollywood is in Showboat, where he sings uh, the, the standard Old Man River, um, which has become uh, immortalized since. And his, his version of that is the most famous version of it, I think. Old Man River, that Old Man River, he must know something, but don't say nothing, he just keeps rolling, he keeps on rolling. In films like Body and Soul and The Emperor Jones, you do see Robeson taking on these more complex and complicated roles before settling into perhaps some more slightly kind of sanctified, uh, saintly roles. But as James Baldwin wrote, um, a lot of these, these black actors have had scripts where the, 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 the complexity is not in the script. So they've had to smuggle complexity into the scripts that simply aren't there. And we have to look into the actors' eyes and, and study their performances to see what they're bringing to us and their lived experiences as black people. Well, as a scholar and an intellect at college, you know, he's always interested in political issues and social justice. He effectively exiles himself because he's smart enough to realise that the roles are simply not there for him. The early stereotypes that have been calcified in American cinema from D.W. Griffith's The Birth of a Nation onwards, this kind of hugely influential and technically incredible but extremely racist film which seems to have informed all of black representation in, in American cinema since. Paul Robeson sees that and he realizes that the roles that he wants to play, dignified, complicated, multifaceted characters, those roles are not going to be available to him. So he takes a chance and he goes to Europe and when he comes to Britain and he stars in films like uh, Song of Freedom and The Proud Valley in Wales where he strikes up a communion with uh, with Welsh coal miners and he becomes increasingly involved and interested in uh, labour struggles and that kind of never left him and when he went back to America he saw what was happening again in Jim Crow America. This is before the civil rights movement really kicked into gear in the 50s and 60s and he's seeing injustice all around him. Here's a question of whether one who wants to sing and act can have as a citizen political opinion and uh, in attacking me 
They suggested that when I was abroad, I spoke out against injustices to the Negro people in the United States. I certainly did. Because of his, his deep-seated commitment to his ideals throughout his career, Paul Robeson found himself um, a you know, hotly disputed figure and also ostracized. And that places him in a line of uh, many high-profile uh, black athletes and public figures, actors, performers, who have spoken out and have found themselves being frozen out. We look at Tommy Smith and John Carlos at the 68 Olympics uh, with their famous Black Power salute, and even up to today with somebody like Colin Kaepernick, who's made a very bold statement and for doing so has found himself uh, frozen out, very much like Robeson was as well. So perhaps uh, when we look at Robeson, we're not looking at someone from the past, but a central figure on a continuum of American race relations. As with so many politically outspoken and controversial figures, there is a note of tragedy to, to Robeson's final years. His passport had been revoked. By the time it was given back to him and he was allowed to travel again, his health was on the wane. Uh, so he did go back to Europe, but his career was never able to, to reach the heights that it should have done. Um, and he died uh, in the late 70s, almost in obscurity, which is a real tragedy for a figure with such colossal talent. Boy.